Welcome back to the Hard Run Box podcast, episode 26 we have got for you today. We're going to open up with some discussion on the games that we've been sort of playing, but mostly just testing because we can't really claim it as playing for our job. But yes, testing things like Horizon Forbidden West, Dragon's Dogma 2, a bit of stuff there. We're also then going to go into some listener mail, some interesting topics about where you should be spending money, how the channel is doing as well, considering things are a bit slow at the moment, just a sort of Hard Run Box update. So yeah that's this episode we'll get into it podcasting we're back for podcasting steve we've got plenty of stuff to talk about well it actually hasn't been that much news going on so it's more Mm. of a there's a few listener mails that i've been keeping an eye on for the past couple of i think some of these were like from a month ago i don't i don't remember we've had them for a while i thought we'll come in we'll do some listener mails but first i wanted to talk about some games that have come out recently that we've been doing maybe a little bit of testing i've been playing a bit of dragon's dogma too so i'll probably talk about that in a moment but You've also been playing the other major release lately, which is Horizon Forbidden West. I say playing because I know you haven't been playing it as a game. You've been uh, testing it, right? Yes, but to be fair, I did play for quite a long time. Ad- admittedly, I played it kind of twice. So yeah, yeah. normally this would be a game where we would do one of our classic, you know, 30, 40, 50 GPU benchmarks. Uh, the mm-hmm. game looked like it would be suitable for such a test. Uh, but of course, I just got back from my holiday, was catching up on other things, and didn't really want to jump into that. I was talking with Andy from eTechnics. Uh, shout out to Andy, who did create a 40 game or 40 GPU benchmark on the game. So big effort from him. I was talking to him about it, and I just said, yeah, like the mental toll it takes. And I don't want to sound like a weak, pathetic YouTuber. It's like, oh, my job is so hard. But <laughs> to sort of sit down and go, okay, I've got, you know, two, three days max to test at least 40 GPUs in this game under maybe three resolutions, three quality presets. It's You're looking at quite a few minutes testing each GPU once you've found a suitable scene and all that, and then you times that by 40, and really you're not getting much sleep across a three-day period, and then you've got to you know, edit, write a script, edit it, upload it, do all that sort of stuff, which I guess I'd palm off to Balin, but... Um, Just the mental toll it takes to go, okay, I'm going to play this 30 to 60 second section of this game like a thousand times over the next three days (laughs) or at least two days. It it, it takes a mental toll. It's a a weird kind of torture test. Sometimes I enjoy it because the results are interesting. So I'm like, oh, I want to see what this GPU does and how it works with this one. So that that sort of – but when it's highly predictable – uh, you get sort of halfway and you're questioning everything, <laughs> questioning your existence. Yeah, and I think for this as well, I think it looked like some outlets had gotten pre-access mm. to the game on PC mm. beforehand, which would have helped with benchmarking and things. We didn't get that sort of access, so it makes it a lot harder to do that sort of content. A lot of other people have, you know, with that access have jumped on board and done testing. So Yeah, that's right. Because I was away, I didn't bother trying to get early access and all that sort of stuff, so... Missed the boat on that one, but I did purchase the game myself, loaded it up, and I was sort of, do I do some sort of specialized content around this? I have done a lot of testing. I'm, I'm not going to at this point. I'll probably save all the information I've got and see how it may change over the coming months. But mm-hmm. one of my key areas of interest, because I absolutely love my RTX 4060 Ti 8GB and 16GB graphics cards... <laughs> Um, they are great for scientific testing. Now. Well, I, come on now. To be fair, I do actually really like them. I like the fact that we have a reasonably powerful GPU, not necessarily by today's standards, but it is, you know, still very sure. capable. Yeah, yeah. And I, I like that we have the two very different VRAM configurations. So that's neat. That's kind of cool. It's basically like having an eight gigabyte and sixteen gigabyte thirty seventy, for example. That would have been neat rather than having yep. to like dabble between Radeon and GeForce to sort of... So anyway, it's just it's an interesting... I, I find the RTX 4060 Ti and its two different flavors an interesting tool for sort of scientific testing and, and looking yeah, at yeah. all this sort of stuff. Uh, and I'm really, really happy that I have them because I think they're going to be uh, very useful, invaluable almost over the next few years for looking at this stuff. So with, with uh, Horizon Forbidden West, great looking game... I thought, hmm, I wonder if you chuck this on very high with or without DLSS uh, and play at 1440p, how the 8 gigabyte and 16 cards uh, vary. Basically, the 8 gigabyte model sucks. Uh, There are 
sections of the game where performance between 8 gigabyte and 16 gigabyte models are very similar. I suspect these are sections where outlets such as Tech Power Up, who do great testing, they found that the 8 gigabyte and 16 gigabyte models had the same performance, which I was surprised by because they right. don't. Yep. But as I said, there are sections of the game where they do. So I'm not calling out their testing or saying they got it wrong. And again, in their defense, this is something that people don't consider is when you test a huge amount of GPUs like they did, like Andy from eTechnics did, it's really difficult to find a section of the game that's you know heavy on the GPU and represents sort of a worst case there or heavy on system stuff like CPU or memory or does it use a lot of VRAM. So it's difficult to find... It can often be difficult to find sections of the game that accurately reflect the performance of all configurations. So, yeah. And and on top of that, just throughout the game as well, like you could, especially if you have only got a couple of hours to figure out where to test, you could ultimately run into an area where it's like very open worldy. There's not a lot of cities or anything going on. And then later in the game, you'll find this big city, which just has completely different performance characteristics. And that's pretty common with Mm -hmm. open world games. I think Horizon Forbidden West, I've played on PS5 a while back and it doesn't have too much of that, but that can be big issues with, I remember games like Metro Exodus, for example, it's sort of got that open linear section, uh, a linear section to open the game. And then you get into the open world and it performs a bit differently between the two. Or you might see like an Assassin's Creed where you start out in some small village, eventually you get to the big village and you have to sort of, I don't know, like justify, can I play, how long into the game am I going to play to find that area? And if so, like how long when you're playing the game would you spend in the big city? Mm Because if you don't spend any time there, then it's not that relevant. So yeah, it's very complicated to do that sort of testing. Definitely. And ultimately you have to pick somewhere. So uh, certainly not having a go at tech power, mad respect for the guys who test boatloads of GPUs because in my experience, it is by far the most difficult testing to do is test a significant number of hardware configurations in a game in a relatively short period of time. Mm-hmm. There's nothing else that comes close. There's no other style, which is kind of why I decided, you know what, I'm going to take, I'm going to do some sort of more specialized testing, look at larger portions of the game with with far fewer hardware configurations because that kind of testing is more enjoyable. And I, I, I really can't overstate enough how much easier it is. The, the mental toll it takes is <laughs> no comparison. So yeah, hats off to, to Tech Power Up and Andy from eTechnics. But I um, yeah decided to have a bit of a more out of interest to see how the 8 gigabyte and 16 gigabyte models uh, behaved. And like I said, there were certainly sections of the game where it was very close, very similar performance in terms of like, you know, frames per second and even frame time performance. But then there were lots of sections of the game where the 8 gigabyte cards or the 8 gigabyte RTX 4060 Ti using the very high quality preset at 1440p, even with DLSS quality enabled, just choked, like really poor frame time performance. Uh, a lot of the cutscenes, which I found interesting, a lot of the cutscenes in the game just did not run well on the 8 gigabyte card. A lot of big stutters, pauses. Hmm, um, interesting. So, yeah. And I uploaded some footage to show you. So you've sort of seen it firsthand. Yeah, but- yeah, yeah. Running around the game, you will run into problems with the 8 gigabyte card. It's it's not a terribly great experience. And then with the 16 gigabyte model, you are you are regularly up around well, you're over 60 FPS generally speaking with DLSS quality enabled. So that's a pretty good experience for that type of game. I'm told reliably, uh, and <laughs> very smooth, very very smooth. No no frame stutters or anything like that. Yep. It was very enjoyable. So what I did was fired the game up. And I played on the 16 gigabyte model to a save point, and then I did the same thing on the 8 gigabyte model, and and just ba- uh, for large portions of it, I recorded that and then compared them, and then I'd play further on with the 16 gigabyte model, and then go back and play that section again with the 8 gigabyte model, and I did that for about three hours, and basically the conclusion is after three hours, the 8 gigabyte card sucked and was insufficient <laughs> yeah. and nowhere near as good. So if you were to buy those products right now, saving the $50, I think it's about $50 Mm -hmm. US on the 8 gigabyte model, you're just shooting yourself in the foot. It's a terrible product in comparison. And we've seen plenty of other examples where 8 gigabytes is no longer enough at that performance tier. Now, look, I haven't spent a lot of time looking at what you have to reduce to make the 8 gigabyte cards smooth throughout the game. I suspect it's not a lot. Uh, it seems like VRAM usage was regularly about one to one and a half gigabytes over the eight gigabyte buffer. So yeah, I've just looked up, uh, the, 
VRAM usage testing from Tech Power Up, mm-hmm. and they say that yeah, on the very high settings, you're looking at like just over eight gigabytes, so like eight point two to eight point eight on those high resolutions. So yeah, 1440p, so I was 4K. seeing more like nine to ten playing the game. Yeah, um, so, so it seems it seems like it's a game where eight gigabytes borderline depending on the configuration but 10 gigabytes mm-hmm. is going to be sufficient for the game which is good and this has always been this sort of nuanced conversation you have to have around vram capacity so if you're if you've got a i don't know a radeon rx 7600 you're mm-hmm. probably not looking at playing with the very high preset probably looking more at high to sort of a medium configuration if you're even looking at 1440p yeah the point is on those cheaper cards you're expecting a more compromised experience. But if you're paying $400 US, which is still, I think that's still quite a lot of money for a graphics card. Yeah, yep, oh, 100%. Uh, as, a, as a privileged YouTuber who has 4090s as doorstops, I still think spending $400 US on a graphics card is um, is a lot of money. I oh, totally. I mean, it's the cost of an entire console. And this is my, always the comparison I go back to. It's like you can either buy a 4060 Ti 8 gigabyte or whatever or buy an entire console. Mm-hmm. Like maybe the 16 gig model these days is about what a PS5 goes for, but it's similar. So it's a lot of money. That's right. And now you do have the option of the 16 gigabyte card for a $50 premium. So should be a no-brainer. Yeah. Yeah. No-brainer. No-brainer. Uh, not a great product. If someone's listening, they think that we're recommending the 16 gigabyte RTX 4062 as a great value product. That's that's not the case either. It just happens to be yeah. a better better purchase. If 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 I had to buy an RTX 4060 uh, Ti, I'd be getting the 16 gigabyte model because that is going to be a much better yeah. product. I think what's really uh, good about Horizon Forbidden West is that this is a title where. It, People are largely saying this is a very well-optimized game. So it's not like The Last of Us Part 1 or mm-hmm. Star Wars Jedi Survivor or whatever previous title. Lots of them have been talked about as being these badly optimized games. This is a game that has really tried to take full advantage of the PlayStation hardware. It was released on PS4, so they've had to do something to get it working within 8 gigabytes of memory. Mm-hmm. And then, obviously, they've got a, a version for PS5 as well, and they've tried to optimize it as best as they can. And even with all of those considerations, it being a cross-gen game that runs on the PS4, it being well-optimized on PC, even with all those factors, if you're trying to play it on the highest quality settings at reasonable resolutions for that type of GPU, the 8 gigabytes of VRAM is not quite enough. You copped a lot of criticism talking about like The Last of Us Part 1 in detail about VRAM issues, and it was Mm. so easy to talk about that and just point it to being like, badly optimized, throw it in the trash, this is not representative of games in the future. And we've come to the complete opposite game that people are praising for how well it runs, and it's still, depending on your configuration, potentially an issue. So I think that's going to be more, we're going to see, again, we've talked about VRAM a fair bit, but this is sort of the the expectation that you can optimize as much as you want, but there are still going to be times when eight gigabytes today is just not enough. Yeah, I mean, criticism's fine, but I think anyone who did criticize what we were, what we were trying to make gamers aware of there was sort of shooting themselves in the foot. It was kind of a bit foolish in my opinion for, for multiple reasons because first of all we made it very clear in that content uh maybe not necessarily that specific uh video the, the last of us part one but we made it clear that it is there are workarounds to reduce the vram usage so we're not saying that mm-hmm. all cards need 16 gigabytes we're not saying there shouldn't be eight gigabyte cards anymore they just need to be priced appropriately we didn't want to see and and we were we were coming at this before the GeForce 40 series was released, and we were basically mm-hmm. trying to head off a $400 8 gigabyte card, which I think now most people, I hope, would agree that a $400 8 gigabyte graphics card is very bad. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I hope that most people would agree. And then there's also the, you know, the Last of Us Part One. A lot of people tried to accuse us of using that example to make this case against Nvidia of all people. Like it was just, it was not really targeted at Nvidia. It was just targeted next generation GPUs from AMD and Nvidia. We don't want to see four hundred dollar mm-hmm. or even three hundred dollar really eight gigabyte cards. But it wasn't just. First of all, it wasn't just the Last of Us Part One. We had plenty of other examples where. The, v, the eight gigabyte buffer is insufficient under playable conditions. Like Halo, for example, where you know we had lots of 3070 owners complaining who played Halo, saying after 20 minutes of gameplay, 
the game either stuttered and ran like crap or the textures went missing or both. And yep. VRAM is such a hard thing to work out as well because you can have insufficient VRAM and not really know it, as we see in a game like Forspoken, for example. Uh, the textures just turn muddy. The game still plays at the exact same frame rate. In, in fact, in some instances, we see insufficient VRAM leading to slightly higher frame rates because it just doesn't even try. Just it, it dele- yep. It's a texture delete. And then the other angle to come at this from is that, yeah, The Last of Us Part 1 was really unoptimized, more so for the lower quality textures, uh, not yep. necessarily what we were talking about. Um, the performance was good. It was just the visual uh, quality was not good. So that was sort of different than what we were talking about in the content. But <laughs> The Last of Us Part 1 is the reality, right? How many games yep. don't launch like The Last of Us Part 1 or Jedi Survivor or Dragon Dogma 2? Or- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pick it, how, how many games? Is that more the norm? And we're not saying okay, game developers, give yourself a pat on the back, releasing crap games that you know people spend money on and then you spend the next six to 12 months actually making playable is a good idea. We're not justifying that at all. We're just facing reality, right? There's so many different ways you can talk about optimization. Like I think a game like Dragon's Dogma 2 that I've been playing is a, a clear example of a game that's badly optimized. It mm-hmm. runs, there are some it's sections awful. that It's really run, bad. <laughs> it, they run terribly. Yeah. Like the... The city section, which I just got to last night in my playthrough, like the main first big city that you get to, the performance is disgraceful. Mm -hmm. Like it looks not, I think the game looks fine, but it's not like a Horizon Forbidden West game. It's It's like a great looking game, to be honest. It's pretty poor. Yeah. There's some parts of the game that don't look good. There's other parts that look fine, but Mm -hmm. yeah, it is what it is, but it runs terribly. Like Mm -hmm. there's just no getting around it. The CPU limitations in the game is severe. It's not good. It Mm -hmm. doesn't run well. So I think that's a, a clear example of you know badly optimized. The, that is largely de- the developer's fault. Mm-hmm. Like there's no hardware configuration that you can get that game running well. I'm playing it on a 7800X3D with an RTX 4090. There is, mm-hmm. it doesn't get better than that. Like maybe an Intel process would be slightly faster, but generally it doesn't get better than that, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're releasing a game and it runs like trash on that configuration and there's plenty of CPU limits, totally on the developer and you can blame them for that. Mm -hmm. I think when you were talking about like Last of Us examples or Horizon Forbidden West, eight gigabytes or whatever, it it gets more to the gray area where it's like if a developer, you know, is the developer needing to spend millions of dollars to optimize, you know, the lower quality settings, which is, you know, possible, right? Because they have to pay some developer to do it Mm -hmm. or some team of developers to optimize the settings. So potentially that's a cost associated with it. Is it easier to get developers to do that or is it easier for the GPU manufacturers to just provide sufficient hardware at reasonable prices? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the time with titles like The Last of Us, the balance was, you know, could go either way. Like you could say they should have optimized the low textures more, but then again, we should have gotten more VRAM. And then there's just some examples where clearly problems would have just been easily solved were they giving you $20 or $30 more VRAM in the GPUs. So instead of developers needing to spend months more on the game, they they don't have the resources to improve the gameplay. So instead of having to waste all this time fixing up low VRAM configurations and stuff that they just, they don't have to worry about that anymore. So that's there's a broad spectrum is I guess what I'm trying yeah, to get at. There's I, I, a lot of different there's a lot of different angles there. Yeah, I think the Last of Us Part One it was it was definitely a bit of both. So the, the yeah. lower quality textures should have been higher quality, like they were very mm-hmm. bad. Um, so that that needed to be fixed, and it didn't seem like it took them too long to fix that. As far as the ultra texture optimization goes, probably a bit unnecessary. Really, you should have had 12 gigabytes of VRAM or 16 gigabytes. For those cards. I'm not saying people should have purchased more VRAM. I'm saying they should have been given more VRAM on those previous generation mm-hmm. parts. Because as I said, RX 6800, if you owned one of those cards, if you owned a Radeon graphics card with, so if you had a 6700 XT or a 6800 series card or better, you would have played that game and not had any problems, at least performance related problems. And th- that that's kind of the point. It's like, <laughs> there's so many different angles to come at this from. And again, we're not defending unoptimized games we're merely saying if you have ample vram chances are you're less likely to run into those problems and have a better gaming experience and again 
look, they might, in the example of Horizon Forbidden West, they may actually optimize VRAM usage there. That, that like what we saw with the last of us part one yeah, it's possible i feel like it only needs a little bit of optimization it may not be possible but they if they do so and it works well on eight gigabyte cards and, and the problems i've been seeing are solved then that's great but at the same time if you were really excited about playing that game and you purchased it upon release and you had an eight gigabyte card you had a less than optimal experience if you wanted to turn up all the visuals and enjoy the game in all of its mm-hmm. glory and then having it fixed months later, how useful is that? Whereas if you just had the 16 gigabyte version of the RTX 4060 Ti, you would have been playing at 60 plus FPS with all the visuals maxed out. Great experience, a lot of fun. Uh, so that's really the point. But I mean, there's there's no simple thing you can say. Like, there's just no. There's you shouldn't look at this in a, in a a simple way. Like you know, or Harbor on Box used an unoptimized port, therefore that was misleading or something like that. It's like, mm-hmm. come on, guys. It's it's much more complex than that. We're coming at it from several different angles. For example, we don't want to see game development stagnate because everyone has an eight gigabyte graphics card in you know, how many years have you been having eight gigabytes at the mainstream for? We don't want that to continue. And it was very close to being the case for this generation where NVIDIA GPUs, the dominant force in the space, was going to offer you eight gigabytes for four hundred dollars, which I mean, it does mm-hmm. right. You have to spend another fifty bucks to get the sixteen gigabytes, and that was previously a hundred dollars more. We wanted to avoid that. We wanted eight gigabytes to be sub three hundred dollars, more like two hundred dollars ideally. And then, if everyone has a twelve or sixteen gigabyte graphics card, things can progress and move forward, and and games in the not too distant future can hopefully look better. And I don't think it's a situation people make the claim that, oh, if everyone had 24 gigabytes of VRAM, games would just all be unoptimized and crap. And I'm like, well, I think the games that were going to be unoptimized and crap were going to be unoptimized and crap. I think the games that were going to be breathtaking and amazing, like, you know, Horizon Forbidden West, were going to be breathtaking and amazing. So I don't think developers would sit back and go, oh, everyone has plenty of VRAM, well, whatever. (laughs) I don't think it works like that. And I think you can clearly see from a game like Dragon's Dogma 2 that gamers, you know, there's not a lot of voting with your wallet when it comes to the optimization of games. Gamers largely are just tolerating whatever is the the situation in the game. Yeah. You know, Dragon's Dogma 2 has had 200,000 plus concurrent players on Steam, which is a huge number for a single player title. Like that's massive. Mm-hmm. So when you, you're looking at gamers just sort of tolerating whatever and not, you know, they're not giving incentives to developers to fix the optimization in their titles, then the next best thing is to have the configurations be the best that they can be so that when gamers are desperate to play games that they really want to play, as you've talked about, and, you know, they really want to enjoy the games, that they've got what, the best possible hardware that they could have to enjoy the experience that they they are being given. And, um, and to know, be clear, you're not saying buy an RTX 4080 or 4090 or or no. whatever to ensure you have enough VRAM. We're not saying spend more money, you dummies, so you can enjoy unoptimized games. <laughs> We're not saying that because I know someone will take it to mean that. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they will. No, what I meant was that we want that whatever budget you had to give you the most you could possibly get at that money. So if you had $1,000 to spend on your PC to play Dragon's Dogma 2 or whatever, that you're getting as much as you possibly can from that configuration so that whatever the developer serves you, you will be in the best possible configuration to tackle that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've seen criticism of PC gamers tolerating these unoptimized games and like buying trash games supposedly and then playing them and, you know, giving developers money to reinforce their bad habits. And I can sort of understand that perspective because there's little other methods that you could use to reinforce to developers to make games better optimized or run better on your PC. But it's it's pretty clear that gamers prefer the quality of the game, as in the gameplay elements, story, the Definitely. the game-related stuff mm-hmm. over the performance. And even for me, like I th- I've been playing Dragon's Dogma 2. I really like the game. I think it's a good quality game that I'm enjoying to play. And yeah, when I get to the city, I'm like, man, this the performance here sucks. Like it's so bad. But then just by chance or luckily enough, not a lot of the action scenes happen in that village area. So it doesn't hugely impact the experience outside of me being a little frustrated that my 
I don't know what my PC would be worth, thousands upon thousands of dollars, is running this game at like 50 FPS. Like that's annoying, but it's, you know, I'm still enjoying playing the game, which I think speaks a lot to how a lot of PC gamers in general work. Like you can complain about the game and we see a lot of complaints on Twitter and Reddit and places about the performance, but then there's still hundreds of thousands of people playing it and enjoying the game elements. So I don't really know how that's going to be solved. Like what's the best option? Like how do you get a developer to make these games run better and incentivize them to run games better? But I think having a mixture of, you know, game developers working hard on these titles as well as making sure that the hardware that we're getting is as good as it can be and not just sitting around and accepting bad quality hardware releases and putting it all on the developers to do all the work to make them run on these crappy hardware products that we've got now, it needs to be coming from it from both angles in mm-hmm. some way. So making sure the hardware is good, making sure developers are doing the best they can to release these games. And yeah, hopefully they'll, you know, as time goes on, there'll be more and more examples of PC games getting better. But I mean, I say that now and it hasn't really been the case over the years. I mean, I think we've been uh, talking about this for a decade and games are still mostly bad. PC games, especially PC ports, in my experience, my recollection of the last 20 years of doing this job, I don't know how to say this where it doesn't create backlash or whatever, but in a lot of ways... In a lot of ways, it's better today than it's ever been, as crazy as yeah. that might sound. No, I think I, I agree with you. When I, yeah, used I think to, I would agree. The amount of times when I was writing for TechSpot that we would have to pass on a new AAA title and not test it because there was no the graphics options required for testing weren't there, or applying simple settings didn't actually work. You had to like edit files and things, or there was no way to turn off VSync in in a game or or whatever. There yeah. was just how often will I, how many times do we see frame caps or like just bad resolution support? Like it yeah. was just, you'd have 1080p, 1440p, maybe 4K options. That's it. Like if you had literally any other display format, it would not work. Yeah. So I mean, a lot of the games common. as well had multiple sort of breaking issues in terms of benchmarking them. Whereas we mm-hmm. don't see that as much. Um, yeah. I'm not, I'm not saying. I'm certainly not trying to say that it's flawless or it's mm-hmm. in a in a great state. I'm merely pointing out that having done this job for a long time and tried to test a lot of these games, that the problems have they're not new. Like games yeah. have been pretty broken and annoying upon release for as long as I can remember, and probably broken in more annoying ways previously than they are now. Yeah, I think the performance versus versus visuals is sort of like the classic optimization Mm -hmm. argument has been pretty similar over the years. Mm -hmm. You know, there's been always been titles that run badly. But I think, yeah, the the areas where things have improved over the years has been all those edge case configurations. You know, developers are much better at supporting unique configurations in terms of whether that's resolution or hardware. And there's there's fewer times when you would launch a game and for whatever reason it just wouldn't work or there'd be annoying limitations. Graphics options, I think, are much more varied now than they Mm -hmm. were in previous years, which you've touched on. So there's many more options for people. Mm -hmm. I think think back to, I don't know, like a decade ago and you'd see... NVIDIA's exclusive features, like they used to have, you know, their game work stuff, which would be like hair simulations and water simulations. And that would be in like, let's say three games a year, Mm -hmm. if that. Mm-hmm. And these days, game developers are largely including features like DLSS and FSR and those sorts of ups. Like a decade ago, that would not have happened. Like seriously, you would have been struggling to convince developers to do that because they weren't even allowing you to disable VSync and just basic stuff. Like the games that don't even support like controller remapping, just like basic stuff was mm-hmm. the norm. So mm. It's good to see those areas have been improved over time. But yeah, the performance side of things is probably going to be always contentious. And, you know, people always have different opinions about like what counts as optimized, like comparing linear corridor games versus open world games and equating the visuals between them. And it doesn't always line up because mm-hmm. open world games require a lot more processing power and stuff like that. So yeah, it's been it's been interesting over the years, but there's always hope for PC gaming. Again, more people are playing games on PC, which helps justify development resources on pc the fact that dragon's dogma 2 has 200,000 
all-time peak players on that game justifies to the developers spend money on this version of the game because this is people are buying this, people are spending money on it. Mm-hmm. Whereas previously, if that was getting like 20,000 or 2,000 all-time peak, then there would just be no effort put into the port at all. Mm-hmm. So PC game getting PC gaming getting bigger improves everything there. Mm-hmm. I want to move on to a listener mail now, which is an interesting listener mail. We had some two conflicting comments here that I just want to read out. And I want to see where you lie and where maybe I lie on this discussion. So the user Srandista, so I probably terribly pronounced that, but I'll go with it. Apologies in advance. Yeah, apologies for that. I just finished podcast now. As an AMD owner, on one side, I think that I absolutely refuse in, refusing NVIDIA as the next GPU is stupid. On the other, I can see why there would be much more people with that opinion on the other camp. As was mentioned in the podcast multiple times, gamers need to vote with their wallet, otherwise nothing will change. If I complain that a 4070 only has 12 gigabytes of VRAM and then bought one anyway, I can't be surprised that NVIDIA would continue with that trend. And there's a reason why I think many AMD owners refuse to buy an NVIDIA card no matter what, because they don't want to support the company which hides everything beyond the walled garden, which thinks that you know selling a $1,000 GPU should be the new normal. And then one of our other Discord members... Nemes has come out with the counter perspective, which is the counter perspective to the voting with your wallet by using Radeon is that by doing that, you're effectively signaling to AMD that their products are good enough and cheaper enough and that there is no need for them to improve. So you're effectively slowing down competition, which seems to be basically what happened at this point. AMD isn't actually trying to compete anymore. Mm. So this brings up the interesting question when it comes to voting with your wallet. Should you not buy NVIDIA so that you send them the message that their pricing or hardware configurations aren't good enough, or should you not buy AMD so that they get the message that, say, for example, being a little cheaper and being a little behind in features isn't good enough? So which way would you go on this when it comes to voting with your wallet? Okay, well, uh, I would like to give a disclaimer before I get into this, because the term voting with your wallet, if we've ever used that, It means more to support better products, I would have thought. Yes. I don't think I use that term often or have potentially ever used that term. Uh, Maybe when it comes to like platform support, like, you know, investing in AM5 over something like LJ1700, but maybe, I don't know. It's not not a term I Mm -hmm. often use and like to use because as a reviewer, this is going to shock some people. I don't actually care who made the product, whether it was AMD or NVIDIA. That's not something I really Mm -hmm. consider, at least not heavily. Like, obviously, you have to acknowledge who made the product, but I don't sit there and think, oh, well, I like this one more because NVIDIA made it or AMD made it. It's, I don't really care who's giving you the most, to be used an overused term, bang for your buck at a certain price point. Mm -hmm. So I'm... First and foremost, we you know, work at the performance, the value, take all all the things that we can into consideration and recommend a product at a certain price point. Or a lot of the time these days, we're like, well, you know, if you have a preference for this, then this one's probably better. If you have a preference for that, then this one might be better, um, which seems to be a lot of the GPU recommendations these days. We don't really sort of say, well, we don't like that NVIDIA does this or did that or AMD did this. So vote with your wallet and buy the competition. Like that's just never advice we're ever going to give. Yeah, so agreed. Given that that's sort of our position, there's really no point picking a side on this issue. I mean, both both uh, comments make excellent points and I, I really agree with both of them. I don't have a voting with your wallet by X brand opinion, really. And this is why I wanted to talk about this little listener mail really is that i see a lot of commenters talking about voting with your wallet like it's something that you hear outside of like reviewers saying it so you'd see commenters being like i'm voting with my wallet this generation i'm not buying this or or, i'm buying the competition i'm switching brands or whatever it always be this voting with your wallet and i agree that reviewers generally don't say those sorts of things i think the reason is that you're kind of doing yourself a disservice as a buyer if you're considering other external factors when you're looking at your buying decision. Like if you're thinking, oh, well, you know, I really like this product and I've looked at the reviews and I've, it's been shown to be the better product that gives me better value and performance for what I'm after. But then, you know, I've got to consider that even though it's good for me, like I don't want to tell NVIDIA that 
this pricing is justified or that this hardware is justified. So I'm going to then buy the worst product that's worse for me to send some message to the company. Like I think that's kind of a, it's almost like a bizarre logic thing. Like it's you're self- then pref- <laughs> it's, a, it's a self-sacrifice that no one knows about. Yeah, like- that's right. It's like, are enough people sending the message that the message is even getting through? Like yeah. when when people are not buying NVIDIA, is NVIDIA actually getting the message or are they just rolling in their AI dollars and not really caring about you know, individual consumers? So I think when it comes to like voting with your wallet, it really should be your vote with your wallet should be to the best product that makes the most sense for you. And then the rest of it takes care of itself. Mm-hmm. So if NVIDIA is selling the better products at that time, then that's going to give AMD the incentive to produce better products so that they're more competitive. It At should. least it should. <laughs> Log- if it t- logic dictates and logic doesn't seem to apply. <laughs> but <anyway. laughs> well, yeah, that's true. AMD uh, seems to love to just copy what NVIDIA is doing to a large degree. But yeah. you know, theoretically, and I think we see maybe more of this in the CPU market, for example, people were voting with their wallet that Intel CPUs were better for a long period of time. And then once because AMD started... Well, they were. That's right. They mm-hmm. were. People were doing what we've been suggesting, which is you vote with your wallet by buying the better product. And mm-hmm. then as AMD starts to make more and more competitive products, people vote with their wallet, so to speak, towards the better product. And then it all takes care of itself. And then you know, AMD's been rewarded for making the better products and incentivizing competition. Intel's been punished to some degree, but then it's on them now to increase their competitiveness and increase their competition. That's really how these sorts of things should work. I think if you're considering, oh, you know, I shouldn't have bought an AMD product because then Intel is going to have no money to, you know, make the next generation of products or maybe it's going to make AMD get all big-headed and, you know, just continue to give worse and worse value as time goes on. I think general market forces take care of those things and it's not up to you, the buyer, to be considering how you should be factoring in those things to your buying decision. Because do you honestly think that NVIDIA, for example, is really listening to the complaints about, say, people who've decided, I'm not, vo- I'm not buying a GPU this generation, I'm voting with my wallet to say no. Like, are they actually sitting in their executive offices and, and listening to that opinion at the moment? I'd say Just that's... pure speculation, I, I guess. I'd say that kind of thing is straight to the trash can. Like, that's an instant yeah. not paying attention to, don't care yeah, I think if they, they sort of saw their sales drop to like very bad levels and they'd probably start making some moves. But yeah, I think generally they're not really paying too much attention to those comments. So yeah, I think that probably covers the uh, the voting with your wallet comments. But I think it's interesting to see that sort of perspective because we see it a lot in comments on reviews and things, people saying that they're going to do this or do that to try and send messages to companies. But unfortunately, these companies are so large that it's really difficult to send that sort of message, I think, especially when Mm -hmm. you look at an NVIDIA, which is such a diverse company and what they produce, that, you know, how much can GeForce GPU owners send a message to those companies? Unless you have, like, everyone banding together, which... Well, again, that happens if the products start to suck or there's major problems or some sort of scandal or something. But, you know, I mean... Uh, even when we had the uh, little run-in with NVIDIA all those years ago now when they wanted us to change our editorial direction and you know, big YouTubers <laughs> and media outlets such as Linus Tech Tips and Gamers Nexus and Jay's Two Cents and basically every man and his dog talked about it and there was huge backlash and people were going to get rid of their, you know, how many comments did we see? People, I'm not going to buy in, you know, GeForce Next Generation. I'm going to get rid of my GeForce GPU and go Radeon. This is, and that was all nice. It was good to, you know, I'm not mocking those people. I'm certainly not doing that. I'm just saying there was, that's probably, at least in our little bubble, our little area of existence, that was the most significant backlash I've seen that was Mm -hmm. virtually universal uh, across major channels and, you know, the whole enthusiast tech scene. And uh, did it amount to much? I don't know. Doesn't seem like it. Yeah, I think people probably put those comments in there and then later when it comes to actually making that buying decision probably would have forgotten about it but yeah i, I on guess top of that- to, to, to be fair to put a cap in that one I- I- nvidia did backtrack quite quickly on that so maybe that helped they did and i think at the time we didn't 
I think I recall saying at the time around Q and A's and stuff when we were asked about this, this mm-hmm. issue with things like, yep. you know, would this mean that you wouldn't recommend an NVIDIA GPU because they've tried blah, 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 X, Y, Z. And I think our answer was always that, you know, it's not really relevant to your buying decision when it comes to buying a graphics card in the future. It's very much still on what is the best product that you want to buy. Like, Well, people would say to that, well, that's foolish of you because they've proven how shady and dodgy they are and how anti-consumer they are. So why are you supporting them? It's like, yeah, you're not wrong, but you think AMD's better? Like, really? Mm Mm-hmm. Like you think AMD, not dodgy major corporation that operates for profit? <laughs> like, yeah, and it's like then how much investigation do you do to find the dodgy things? Like, mm. and then you get this big list of dodgy things that both companies have done. It's like how are you then preferencing the dodginess of all well, the dodgy stuff, right? It also, gets so complicated. AMD's competitors have been in uh, what an advantageous sort of position where they've had a significant advantage over AMD and they want to maintain that advantage and they're willing to do just about anything to mm-hmm. maintain that advantage. So they get caught in more legal fights and you know getting sued by governments or whatever for anti-consumer practices, whereas AMD doesn't see as much of that because they just they can't afford to. Like that so so I'm I'm not saying I'm not saying that AMD is the worst ever and you know they have the same reputation as Intel or NVIDIA. They just haven't been in a position to to guard that reputation. I'm just I, I'm merely saying that if AMD was the dominant force, that things necessarily wouldn't have been handled any differently. They'd they'd yeah, want right. to maintain that that dominant position at, at all costs. That's right. And governments as well have different standards that they apply to different levels of company. The more of a monopoly you are, the more likely you are to run into regulatory issues like we're seeing from Google and Apple Mm -hmm. right now who are getting sued left, right and centre by uh, governments for various different issues. Like Apple in smartphones is not a monopoly. Mm -hmm. Like they, well, not not a monopoly in the sense that the only phone that you can buy is an Apple product. Like Mm -hmm. there are many competitors to Apple it's just that in various different areas, they might be in the market leader position or whatever, so governments go after them and they don't go after the company that's got 20 or 30% market share, which is sort of where AMD is at with GPUs at the moment. But mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, companies, they all basically run at a very similar philosophies when they get into certain positions. It's all driven by shareholders and things. So again, it's like if you're making this long list of not relevant to the product factors. So if you're excluding all the performance and value stuff, and you're making a list of, okay, well, I need to vote with my wallet because of X, Y, and Z reasons to send v- all these messages to different companies. And then on top of that, oh, I need to factor in what's the company's reputation like? How dodgy are they? What are the bad dealings that they do? Are they ethical? Do they do open source things? Because that's often a thing that people are talking about. Mm-hmm. It gets to the point where it's so complicated and you just end up having highly biased decisions because you get get into these positions where you're again tossing up when nvidia did this does that outweigh amd doing this or it's like two kids yeah you're just (laughs) arguing about naughty (laughs) yeah exactly it's like they're probably all going to do dodgy things and I, i think you could make you know, probably a five hour long video that in depth breaks down and comes to some sort of definitive decision about which company has done the more bad things in general. But when it comes to buying decisions, I think consumers generally should be sticking to the basics of the product. Mm-hmm. Is the product good? Does it suit your your purchasing needs? Is it the best value that you can get? And the rest of the stuff will take care of itself through just general market forces and discussions yeah, and things. It's like give them an inch, they'll take a mile. With, with stuff like um, yep. CPUs, platforms, all that sort of stuff. There's obviously an optimal model for making the most profit, right? Yeah. And Intel's probably honed and worked on that model over years of dominance to to milk every last dollar. And if AMD became by far the most dominant force and Intel was basically nowhere, like AMD was in the FX days, then you'd probably see AMD moving to adopt a similar optimal for-profit model, right? Like, yeah, they're just, That's, there's well, no chance they don't capitalize on that if they can. And it's not even like whether or not the executives want to do that or not. It's like they have an, uh, they have an obligation to their shareholders to drive the most profits that they can. To do the thing they're publicly, designed to do. <laughs> 
Yeah, they're a publicly traded company, uh, so shareholders hold them accountable to things like driving profits and dividends and, and all that sort of thing to their shareholders. That That's just how it works. So, of course, they're going to be doing things like that once they get into a position where they can drive more and more profits because the shareholders would probably sue them if they didn't do it. And it's like when they tried to end platform support for AM4 and a lot mm-hmm. of people were sort of justifying why they would do that because of technical reasons due to bias capacities and, and things of that nature. And we're just, we just sat there like, nah, <laughs> like <laughs> we weren't not buying that crap, <laughs> not having a bar of it. It's like, I don't care how difficult it is. I don't, I don't, I don't care. You made this promise. And then people will go into whether or not they promised and whatnot, mm-hmm. but they, they, they misled at best. And mm-hmm. regardless, uh, we were told that we were foolish be- for going against them because it wasn't technically possible and we were, we were asking the impossible. And what was it, like a week later after we made our video <laughs> saying, nah, keep AMD accountable, this is BS, they can definitely continue platform mm-hmm. support. And uh, yeah, to the credit of the uh, enthusiast community that owned AMD processors, they kicked up enough of a stink. A week later, AMD back paddled and then, you know, <laughs> thankfully... The community helped AMD make what I would say is the best platform that has ever existed, best consumer mm-hmm. platform ever. Uh, yeah. And AMD tried and, to screw that up. I think you could probably argue as well that doing your continuing platform support for that platform was actually probably the best business decision for them as well. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> you could certainly make that argument. I think you know, obviously there's some business decisions that would cost the company money and not benefit anyone but the consumer, which companies generally don't tend to take those things as to benefit the company uh, in some way. But I think in that decision, it was definitely beneficial to the consumer and AMD, which was why it was good to see them do it. And the, and that is because of AMD's current position where they weren't by far the most dominant force. It improved mm-hmm. their position by making their products more attractive to buyers. That's right. But yep, 100%. If, if they were in the position of 80% or 90% of the market share, then that particular move wouldn't have been nearly as beneficial to them because they don't mm-hmm. need that particular feature to become the best. They're already undoubtedly the best, which is why yeah, it's a reversal of roles. So then you stuff like platform support goes out the window because it's like, well, we're, yeah. just, not, we're just not offering that. And the alternative sucks big time. It's an AMD FX situation. <laughs> so buy our crap or, I don't know, good luck. <laughs> and that's yeah, why that's right. we always say we don't want those situations. We want a healthy uh, battle between you know, mm-hmm. the, the two dominant companies, really, in that example, the only two companies. We've got another listener mail here, which is just talking about the Hardware Unbox channel in general, which I think is probably pretty relevant considering where things are at the moment, which is from Alvin. We we only care about the Hardware Unboxed podcast channel here on the Hardware Unboxed podcast. Which is doing very well, but (laughs) (laughs) to be fair, it is. Anyway, uh, so Alvin asks, uh, how are your channels doing? Other tech creators seem burnt out, suggesting viewership is at an all-time low for tech channels. Your videos certainly aren't getting the same view numbers now as they did three years ago, but overall Hardware Unbox still seems to be in a pretty good shape. People don't have as much free time as they did during the pandemic, so the effect is probably not limited to tech channels. Or do you think there is less interest in tech with the lack of big advancements and ridiculous prices we're seeing? Mm -hmm. Or is it mostly viewers valuing their time again, wanting to watch high quality content like Hardware Unboxed, while many of the low effort creators, that was in inverted commas, that rose as a pastime during the pandemic are now getting put where they belong? Are you worried about the future of Hardware Unboxed at all? Do you see yourself expanding, covering more topics, or is the hub formula working and will you keep doing exactly what you're doing? Is there anything you would love to add but can't because you don't have time or the equipment to create content that isn't up to Hardware Unbox status? So lots of questions there, but just generally asking Excellent. how the channel's going, yeah. what's the sort of I mean, feedback yeah. from people? Yeah, great question, Alvin. Just damn. All right, I've got to do a couple of breathing exercises before I get into this one. Yep. Uh, where do I start with this one? So I guess are we worried about the future of Harbor Unboxed and the job that we do? No, I don't think, like, the way the market's been for the last little bit is concerning, I, I suppose, but whether it, to the point that I worry about the the future mm-hmm. of the job that we do here in the channel, no, I think things will improve and get better, at least more interesting. So 
not a concern of mine. What about you, Tim? Yeah, I think I'd have a similar sort of opinion. I mean, obviously it's not ideal the how the market in general is going, and I think mm-hmm. that has driven lower views at least certainly to our Hard Run Box main channel, but also Mm -hmm. you see across many other channels that most people are in a very similar position. But that's not, I wouldn't say it's unusual given the circumstances that we're in. Like if if interest was low, but the products were good and the products are really interesting, then I'd be very concerned. I'd be like, that's, whoa, you know, people are making good stuff, but I guess people just don't care about PC gaming anymore or going away Mm. from that. But I think it kind of makes sense that if you've seen a generation that gets released and there was a lot of interest around the launch of like the 40 series and stuff like that. Mm. A lot of interest around there. Then people kind of got an opinion of what it was, right? Like they sort of saw it and they're like, yeah, okay, this is going to be a bit of a bust. Like this is sort of set up for, for a fail. And I think the announcement in particular, the 40 series was really bad. Like the reaction to that was well, they had to extremely <laughs> negative. Yeah, they had to, Unlaunch. They had to, when have they ever done that? Unlaunch a product, right? It's, that's so rare. So that was such a disaster that I think that kind of set the tone for a lot of what was to come. Mm-hmm. And now we're just in that period now. We're just, mm-hmm. those are the products that we've got and that's just driving low interest and low views. And mm-hmm. that, that kind of makes a lot of sense, right? So yeah, I think the interest in general for PC gaming, like are people still PC gaming? The answer is definitely yes. Like PC gaming is still very popular. Again, we just talked earlier in this podcast about crazy numbers for like Dragon's Dogma 2 on PC, Helldivers 2 did crazy numbers on PC, huge success. So PC gaming is still very popular. It's just that a lot of people obviously have the hardware that they're tolerating at the moment is probably the best way of putting it. And I think people will be... Yeah, the interest will come back once products, you know, once the products deserve the interest, really, and the success and fail failure of hardware unboxed, you know, it's it's largely on the products that are being released, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I see it with my own friends when things are exciting and there's new hardware and there's new exciting performance to be had. All my mates are in my ear, like, "Oh, can you help me out with the computer? I want to upgrade, or what should I buy?" And all that. And over the last year, people are like, "Eh, no, nah, what I got's fine." I like, yeah, the guys that yeah. I see regularly upgrading just haven't been upgrading. They're just sticking with whatever they had last and they're waiting for something exciting to compel them to upgrade. And I think that's probably the majority of people. So yeah, that, that sort of explains that side of things. Yeah, and I think economic factors don't help either. Well, like that's back, true. Back a few years ago, even before the pandemic started, I think people were a lot in a much more healthy position in terms mm-hmm. of you know general day-to-day living expenses and expose, um, disposable money because, mm, you yeah. know, Cost really you need to have- much lower. Well, yeah, yeah so re- it was really, yeah. Really, you need, you know, some sort of disposable income to do PC gaming. It's not an essential. So if people are focusing more on the essentials these days, then yeah, people are not going to be as interested in upgrading their PC, which makes a lot of sense. And then on top of that, if people spent way too much money on a GPU during the pandemic, like they bought it during, during cryptocurrency mining or something, and it was- a highly inflated purchase in terms of the price, you're probably going to be less likely to want to upgrade soon because you spent so much money during mm. that period that it kind of has to bounce out over, I guess, a longer period of time. So there's many factors there, and I think that probably explains why why the channel is where it's at. I think some channels have been able to you know, create slightly different content over this time that sort of kept people engaged and interested. It just depends on the type of creator. I think Hard Run Box, we're very data and product driven channel like a lot of the stuff we do Mm. is reviews and testing and analysis yeah i was going to talk about that in a second Um, so yeah as i say the just to put a cap in that last part of that paragraph there was expanding or covering more topics which we've talked about a lot that comes up a lot in the q a's people want you know us to do peripherals and stuff like that they want to sort of take a analytical and scientific testing type approach to things like mice and and keyboards. I yeah. think there's some guys out there that do a great job of that already. Uh, but basically the answer is no. We're not looking at expanding or covering really because, and I've said this before and some people don't believe me when I say it, but I don't really do this as a job. And I, I know for a fact you don't either. If Harbour and Box went belly up tomorrow, that would be inconvenient to you. It would suck. But you've got a master's degree in engineering. So you wouldn't be like scratching your head going, oh no, what do I do with myself now? Also, there's we get job offers on occasion, not so much these days because I think they know there's no point 
making a job offer to us now that you know the channel is what it is. But Tim or I could get a job at any of the major companies in the industry doing various different things as well. So there's plenty of options to, to go that way. So it's not so much that I do it as a job. It's I do it because I enjoy it. And I yep. do it in a way that I enjoy it. So obviously I like the CPU and GPU stuff. There's a lot of other things like the CPU and GPU scaling content. I love making that and doing all that sort of stuff, the big GPU head-to-heads. Tim obviously uh, kind of enjoys monitors, I've been <laughs> led to believe. So he does monitor testing. He's he's into it. Well, I'm sort of talking to you in the third person, but you're into it, aren't you, Tim? You like your monitors. Yeah. I mean, I think part of that's come from finding back, back when I was you know starting doing this content right mm-hmm. so like you were covering most of our CPU and GPU content and that was the case when we were both working at Techspot as well mm-hmm. so it's kind of just doing other things I'm like okay got to find something to that's sort of interesting and displays was sort of one of the more interesting things to cover and you know not a lot of people were covering it so over time as you sort of get better and better at doing things then that sort of incentivizes you to to keep doing it really if you sort of yeah you, you know, are very, you're good at doing it. It's yeah. You're very passionate about it. Uh, you, yeah. You, the, the the sparkle I see in your eye when you talk to an engineer about color science, I'm just like, yep, something going on there. <laughs> so, so yeah, I enjoy it. Yeah, you love I think it. I don't know whether I would say like I'd be super passionate about displays, which is kind of weird to say because I do spend a lot of my time testing them. Mm-hmm. I find them very interesting, but I, I do think a lot of that interest has come from just picking that as a thing to do and mm-hmm. then trying to get better at it. Like it's sort of, well, you know, yeah. the sort of incentive to get good at your job and improve and just sort of like your own personal goals, right? Like you're sort of in a position to do something. And so you just do it and you try and get better and do a really good job of it. And I think that's sort of driven more passion over the years really for that. Because back in the day, like I was interested in covering phones. That's what I originally was doing at TechSpot, for example, and you know, PC hardware was obviously very interesting for me as well. Not that there was, you know, at TechSpot really the opportunity to do stuff like that. So yeah, I mean, like I'm not super interested in having a team of people that I have to manage to do keyboard and mouse reviews or cases or fans or storage or whatever people are asking for. Like I don't have the interest in managing people like that. Like mm-hmm. I have to manage Balin when I get him to edit my videos sometimes, he's but that's nightmare. about, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely not. He's great at doing that. I, he's a much yeah. better editor than me. But anyway, I think if I had to, you know, use my position as, you know, I don't know, part of this channel as a leader of the channel or whatever, and yeah. suddenly I've got 10 people that I'm, you know, looking over their work and making sure they're testing things properly or training them to do testing because it's not as simple as just you can go from uni into just immediately doing product testing straight away you have to build up that experience over time which takes you know research and learning and stuff so i'm just not interested in doing that i think you're in a similar position yeah yeah. there's no interest in having that sort of team we're just interested in doing the content we're interested in Mm -hmm. yeah yeah well yeah in short that's exactly right we're doing the content we're interested in if there was other content we were interested in we'd we'd be doing the other content Mm -hmm. so it's that simple really i mean i could not care any less about cases and i yep. pretty much never looked at a case review i did review cases back in the day for tech spot but mm-hmm. um fallen out of love with them a long time ago uh probably because they're all sort of like you know how much evolution has happened on uh, in the case game but i know you know, gamers and nexus do a good job of covering them well i think they do i don't really watch that particular content from them but people seem to enjoy it it gets good views so i'm certainly saying I'm certainly not saying that content's useless or shouldn't be done. I'm just saying I personally am happy with just about any case. Like it's got some holes mm-hmm. in it. You put some fans in it. The stuff goes in. I'm a bit like Buildzoid when it comes to, um. well, I'm probably better than Buildzoid because he doesn't use cases at all. I at least use cases. So that's probably a step up there. And then, you know, yeah. I care about keyboard and mice because they do make a big difference to gaming, but then... A lot of that's sort of subjective as well. So I spend a bit of time tinkering and working out what keyboard and mouse it is that I like that I get the best results with. Um, and anyway, so so that sort of answers that part of the question. Uh, but yeah, I think I think uh, the Harbour Box channel is doing okay. It's certainly not doing as well as it was doing through COVID, but there are other reasons for that. Obviously, there was a lot more people watching content, so everyone was doing really well because they were locked in their houses and or too scared to go outside, one of the two. Uh, 
we're doing a lot less content as well. So we used to do a minimum of five, five to six videos a week during that period, where now we do a maximum of four. So Mm -hmm. it is quite a lot less content we're producing. Uh, And then, yeah, the, the interest thing, like our content is certainly, in my opinion, this is my opinion of our content, I would call our content boring. It's not entertaining. Yep. It's, yeah, yeah. It's very boring yep. content, what we do. Uh, that's by design. Like, I sort of look at us as, and not to toot our own horn, but I think we're one of the few channels that have successfully made sort of the transition from the tech website style or format that, you know, like if you read or, or go to a, a tech power-up review, we're kind of the video format of that because, you know, we our scripts go up on TechSpot and they're a similar format to Tech Power Up. So I look at us as more of the traditional tech website format. Uh, and there are a few others doing that. I'm not going to name names because some of them I do really respect. They just haven't done nearly as well as what we've done with that really boring format. <laughs> and I, I honestly yeah. think it, you don't watch us unless you want to know. Uh, I'm generalizing. I think the the majority of people won't watch our content unless they want to know like which one they should buy or how they perform because it is just, it's, it's boring. I, I don't really, yeah. in, in my opinion, I don't know how else to put it. Like there's guys like Jay's two cents, uh, Linus tech tips who get really good views and they still are getting really good views. And I think it's because their content's much more entertaining. It's less like here's a graph and here are the percentage differences. Here's, you know, mm-hmm. some monitor graphs. Actually, here's 60 monitor graphs. Uh, so, and I, I think another one that probably falls in that category, I don't watch enough of his content, but I do really like it, like Ali from Optimum Tech. He's mm-hmm. he's in a different category to Linus and Jay for sure, in my opinion. It's, it's, it's very, well, I don't want to say it's very high quality because that sort of insinuates that Jay and Linus aren't, but it's... Um, it's still very scientific. It's very like sort of what you get from Harbour and Boxed or Gamers Nexus, but in a more entertaining format, I would say. Just does a really good job of it. So Yeah, I think it's sort of that that mixture, right, of he, he, there's always a space for different types of creators, Yeah, right? his contents are more entertaining in my opinion. I would be more inclined to watch all of his videos than, say, Gamers Nexus or certainly us. So mm-hmm. I, think, I think that's why we suffer more with – how interesting the industry is because you're not going, Oh, I want some tech, uh, entertainment. I'll go to Harper unboxed. <laughs> like, no, no. I listen to Tim talk about modern no. or Steve bang on about percentage differences with GPUs or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that's a big part of it as well. If I'm just going to be perfectly honest, I, I think we are the boring side of, of yeah. tech YouTube. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I see us as very much like a resource really. Yeah. And you're, interest in a resource kind of like a dictionary or wikipedia Mm -hmm. sort of is very much related to do you want to learn about that topic or not Mm -hmm. as opposed to like a tv channel or you know as you've pointed out all the sort of more entertainment focused youtube channels which do have plenty of information in them a lot of the time but just the way that the videos have have been structured is is very different i i think you know even there's times when I find it difficult to watch my own videos back because I don't find watching my own videos that interesting. Like you're I've like, rec- you're like, how is how is anyone else doing this? <laughs> I yeah, there's kind of a bit of that, right? Like yesterday, I got back from Balin's editing the 4K W OLED LG review, which was a 35 minutes long. I think it's one of the longest reviews I've ever done on that channel. And look, it's it's a challenge to watch the whole video the whole way through, and it's not really designed to be watched the whole way through and yeah. i think some of your videos are similar where mm. it's it's really you can pick and choose the sections of the video that have the most interesting content for you and it's perfectly fine to skip over certain parts of the video it's, that you're just not interested in it's like the workings out right people mostly yeah. want to see the intro and then predominantly the conclusion mm-hmm. and a lot of people don't really care how we got there they just want to know like just tell me like which one should I get or or summarize the value so they'll, mm-hmm. they'll jump to cost per frame and not necessarily look at the 12 games we use to come to that conclusion whereas other people want to know everything um, they're definitely in the minority and they're the MVPs for sure so we love you guys thank you very much uh, but we don't hold a grudge against those mm-hmm. that just skip through because like I get it Tim obviously gets it <laughs> yeah <laughs> So it's yeah. just, uh, we, we do the, we do the content and the format because we enjoy it. We like to have that sort of format, but yeah, we realize that it's not great for watch time. It's kind of 
boring or is boring. Yeah, it's it's not good for the YouTube stats. Like no. No. The, if we were doing this format and we were optimizing it 100% for YouTube, like you we were targeting the things that YouTube loves, which are things like click-through rate and watch time and, and those sort of areas. And you know, YouTube's really big on things like retention in the first however long of the video, like the first 10 or 30 seconds or whatever. So you see a lot of other creators, especially the entertainment focused channels where there's almost like no intro to the video at all. It's like they just jump in immediately do something in like the first second of the video. It's like, bang, they're straight into doing things. And I just have no interest in making that sort of video. Like I'll do that format occasionally because it works for some mm -hmm. particular reason. Like I just want people to know straight away that the product's bad or good, for example, but often there is just, you know, I'm describing what the product is. Like, why should you watch this video? Why should you spend 35 minutes watching my monitor review? I kind of have to explain what the product is first. Otherwise, there's no point you getting that information, right? So yeah, resisting the YouTube format and formula. I know people have complained about our clickbait titles at times and things like that, which is, you know, fair. But Well, they're not know, clickbait though. They're no, just, they're, they're not. They're they're attractive titles yeah. to get you to watch we're, the we're video. Not, we're, not, it's not, it's, we're not saying it's not hey, misleading. Yeah, we're not saying hey, this is in the video, and then it's like a video about something completely different. It's just we're trying to. It's, just, it's the game you have to play, right? Otherwise, you just yeah. you, you go nowhere. So yeah, and it, I think we're trying as best as we can to resist most of the other aspects of the game that we could be playing. Sure. To do better on YouTube, things like as I mentioned, no intro, just like going straight into it, and even just things like. Yeah, I think about when I'm, not that I do as much editing now, but when I was editing more videos, things like a lot of other creators would have background music as an example, like throughout the whole video. So, you know, there's a bit more of an entertaining or you can change the vibe of the video based on, you know, the background music that you put in. And it takes time and effort to find the background music, put it in, edit it in. You know, you can do much more crazy things with like motion graphics and I'd probably like to have some more motion graphics in my videos at times, but it always comes back to like, you know, people watch the video, you know, we're providing a resource for people, largely for people who are interested in products to get the information that they want. Does me adding and spending an hour or two hours trying to find background music for my review really enhance the video significantly? Does it impact people getting the same information? It's like, it doesn't really affect that too much. So I'm, would rather put my time and effort into doing more reviews, you know, testing more products, doing the next analysis, you know, making really relevant content for people. And I think that goes back to why we don't cover things like keyboards, mice, whatever other peripherals mm -hmm. you want to talk about is that the options for us are either hire more people to do that, which we've talked about why we don't want to become managers because that takes time away from us actually making the content. But then if it was you or me doing that content, like I taking time away from covering monitors or doing the high run box work that I do to now suddenly start testing keyboards, then that's less monitor content that you're going to get. If mm -hmm. you start doing that means there's less big CPU and GPU benchmarks because you'd be spending time testing keyboards. So mm -hmm. I think when people talk about like, you know, expanding and covering things, they want our opinion on these products, maybe not necessarily a, a new hire or something, which again, you can develop a, a new hire and a new tester on the channel to a level where people would be interested in their opinions over time. But I think what people mean is they want you and me to double or triple the amount of time we have to start testing all these other products to give our opinions on them that can come from us. And I think mm -hmm. it's very, it, it's, impo it's legitimately impossible to do that. Like, I'm really happy that my monitor reviews that I make, I test their products, they're my opinions, Everything that I've seen is something that I've analyzed and I've found and I'm, you know, happy to talk about and give my opinion because I've used the product and I like it that way. If I had to move away from that to hire people to do the testing, which then I'm just presenting videos, it's kind of not what I'm interested in doing. So mm -hmm. yeah, the the way that Hardware Unbox and Monitors Unbox and all our channels work is kind of if it continues to work for us, then I'm I'm happy with that. I'm not interested in I think I've talked about this in the past. I'm not interested in like getting growth year over year and setting that as a target. If it's sustainable, that's fine. Yeah. And I think, was there anything about burnout in that question or whether we're getting burnt out or something like that? I've I think said. they were saying that other tech creators were getting burnt out because right. of various factors. Is that something that's affecting you? Uh, no, not not total burnout. It's just enthusiasm for what I 
used to love doing and still do uh, is lower mm-hmm. it, because because of reasons we've discussed. Uh, but I, I don't think I'm going to get completely burnt out or whatever. There's just some periods where it's like, oh, this product kind of sucks. And now I've got to dedicate multiple days to uh, you know, yeah. getting the yeah. review done. I think I think we've got a pretty good balance at the moment, sort of doing the two minimum of two videos a week, um, but it's sort of our maximum as well. The, the goal is two videos each per week, which ends up being four videos per week in total. That's very sustainable. Um, we can make higher quality videos, put a bit more time into them and, and stuff like that, which is all great. Uh, because if you go back to sort of 2017, 2018, probably yeah, up to 2019, I was spending 16 to 18 hours a day, seven days a week, which sounds like BS. Like I look back and think no, but my wife assures me that that was definitely the case. Uh, yeah. And that was not sustainable. Uh, but I think the only reason I pulled it off and it was relatively easy to do so is just because I was so excited about it, enjoying the hell out of it that it was almost or probably was addictive. Like I just mm-hmm. couldn't get enough of it. So it was easy to just push myself all day, every day. And, and it was also a necessity to bring you on and make it so it was sustainable for you. Uh, and yeah, but these days we still, I still spend a lot of time on it, like the majority of my time, but I think it's very sustainable moving forward, at least for me. So yeah, yeah. I just need to be exciting again. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Like I think it's, you know, the work-life balance has been pretty important to get right because, mm-hmm. you know, you c- even if there is like a sustainable period of time where it may be like a year or so where you can go ham and just create tons of content, like it's pretty unlikely that was ever going to be possible for like decades. Mm -hmm. Like it's just, there would have always reached a limit there with that. And so I think at least for me, like my interest in working more hours or less hours does depend on the products and the, the time that it is. Like just the other day I was for that, W OLED review that was a really interesting review so I think I was like film you might have even seen if you look at the very closely at like the time stamp that's actually on like the taskbar and some of the footage I was recording some of the b-roll at like 11 p.m or like right. midnight or something I was like yeah I'm just really interested in getting this video out getting it done like it's a really exciting product but then other products are just like I just see them I'm like yeah I'll just I'll take that b-roll tomorrow you know mm-hmm. so it just yeah that's right it allows a sort of balance between you know what's happening and also just external things as well like if there's a game i'm really interested in playing or something then maybe i'll be less interested in putting in the extra hours on products that i'm not like super excited about covering like there's mm-hmm. just there's other things going on so outside mm-hmm. of work hours i'll just not do work for once so yeah I, it, it does change a bit depending I, on the time I guess a more positive way of looking at it is that we, you know, I spent those three years doing what looking back almost seems like impossible hours. And then the last two years or so have been pretty cruisy for the most part, more so than I'd like. But a positive way is, you know, that helps probably avoid burnout despite Mm -hmm. lowering uh, excitement levels. And then if things do happen to pick up later this year or next year and we have to go ham again and, put in stupid hours then you've kind of recovered and recouped to do that i'd prefer it to be more of a seasonal thing than than years between but uh, yeah you know it, it's better than burning out completely if if it had been really exciting and there just been major product release after major product release then there probably is a risk of of burnout there because i certainly wouldn't just take the time out to miss a product release i would have to cover yeah. everything so i'd guard it pretty relentlessly so maybe that would be a, a fault there that I've been forced to avoid. Yeah, and I think that's how we sort of have to look at it as creators at times. You know, if you're seeing, if you're seeing that the views aren't as strong as they were during the periods when everything's really exciting and you're working really hard, then you know you need to be seeing that as sort of more of a rest period. Really, like you know, it's the interest really isn't there at the moment. Things aren't going as as well as they have been. So you know, don't take it too hard, right? Like just you know, yeah. use it as sort of that time to you know figure out some things relax a bit, take it a bit easier so that, as you say, when things pick up, you just, we're, we're ready to go really. Yeah. But so if we're sitting here and sort of saying, people aren't really interested in the content as much as they usually are and views are down and we look in the little YouTube studio app and we're seeing all the the down arrows and stuff and it's all looking bad. Like you can get, that can sort of get in your head at times like, oh, that's, you know, a, not a good position and maybe, maybe I need to crank out another, you know, 100 hour week next week to improve the channel, to turn things around or whatever. I think seeing it in the other way, it's sort of going, well, you know, 
there's reasons why people aren't as interested now. So I'll just try and make the best content that I can make and things will take care of itself. I'll, you know, make sure I'm taking care of myself and not getting burnt out. And then as things pick up, we'll, we'll be ready to go. Another way of looking at it is it's not like we're going broke uh, or we're struggling <laughs> to pay the bills. So, you know, probably don't stress or whinge about it too much. Like no one likes to go backwards or th- see things heading in the wrong direction, but yeah. it's, it, yeah, I think it's, it's still very sustainable. Uh, we're, you know, right in this position we are right now, we're much better off than we were during the grind period. Uh, and, I th- and I think things will pick up again and it'll all be fun again. But yeah, the, the views and the money and stuff aren't things I pay too much attention to these days, unless something goes horribly wrong. Like we've had a few videos that we've just sent out to die because, I don't know, YouTube something or other. Um, but th- 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 that can be frustrating when we have to deal with that sort of stuff. Uh, but all creators mm-hmm. do. Like there's been Recently, there's been quite a few YouTube bugs that have affected quite a few YouTube creators where videos haven't gone out properly and have had to be deleted or fixed or stuff like that. So that can be annoying. But at the same time, it's kind of impressive that the platform works as reliably and as well as it does. So Mm -hmm. I guess take that as a win. All right, let's take a break and we'll come back and we'll talk about Steve's generator updates. I'm I'm keen on this. Nice. All right, we're back. I can safely say that I've been doing very little that has been interesting in this past week, very true to the boring life status. Good job. But Steve, I've seen BTS videos in our, or not videos, but pictures in our Discord community for Hard Run Box supporters. Yes, my boring- Of a crane yeah. delivering something to you. My boring life hasn't been as boring because I've spent a ton of money. That's usually how that works, <laughs> right? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's how you avoid a boring life. Uh, now, we've talked about it in previous podcasts, but for those who aren't quite up to speed- Uh, I live in a rural area Um, in Victoria. We have aging infrastructure, not just power lines and transformers and all that, but we have aging power plants and the weather's getting a bit more wild, whether it be, you know, the peak of summer or winter. So we've been getting power knocked out for days, if not weeks um, over the last few years. And it's really only predicted to get worse, which is a pain in the butt because, you know, I work and I work from home, so having no power or having to run off a dinky little generator, which sometimes trips or runs out of fuel, is a pain in the butt. Uh, we also have him an employee now, Balin. We pay Balin to come, and uh, about a month ago, we lost power for four days, and Balin and I sort of just gave up. So we sort of just sat there. I was paying Balin what I pay him, and he was twiddling his thumbs. So <laughs> kind of sucked for both of us. He was bored, and I was paying him for doing next to nothing. And I thought, well... I'm going to have to pull the trigger here. We're going to have to look into doing some sort of uh, you know, backup power. Anyway, my research led me to the best solution being a diesel generator, which uh, split the comments in the comment sections that I have to do with people who were sort of experts on the subject, subject saying that a diesel generator is absolutely the best way to go, uh, whereas people who seemed less knowledgeable were thinking filling a shed full of batteries would be the best option. Um, they both have their cons and pros. But in the end, I went with the diesel generator. So it's a 17.6 kVA diesel generator, uh, and it's now installed. And obviously, we haven't well, we haven't had any power loss in that period of time, but we have been able to simulate power loss simply by turning the mains off. Essentially, what happens is it's all automatic. So you, as long as the generator has fuel in it and all the necessary coolants and whatever, so as long as it's kept an eye on and serviced, which it is, it'll be fine. But it's a brand new generator. Uh, if the mains power goes off, it detects and the ATS module automatically switches over to the generator. So upon power loss, you have to wait about 10 seconds. It switches over, the generator fires up, and after the generator's been running for about 20 seconds, it switches over. So there's probably about a 30-second period there where you have no power, uh, but we have those new UPSs and everything. So my office just stays all powered up and can do so for about four hours. So, yeah, it's great. Uh, when it's running, nice. it's relatively quiet. Uh, it keeps the same sort of tone. It runs at about 1,500 RPM, uh, regardless of whether you're sucking down, you know, 80% power or 10%. So there's no, like, you know, the, the petrol generators revving up and down all over the place, making a ton. It's sort of like a, a PWM fan. Uh, this thing just basically sounds like it's idling. It kind of sounds like a locomotive. It's a very deep diesel sort of hum. Um, mm-hmm. So... But in the studio, we can't hear it, which is good because the petrol, the, the cheap 
like 7 kVA petrol generator we could hear in here because it's just like running a ride on lawnmower outside your door. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Whereas this thing's a low hum and yeah, we're 15 meters away from it here and you just can't hear it all, like not even a little bit. So that's great for the mics and everything for recording. Uh, and yeah, it's got some, it's got a lot of smarts in it. It's all digitally operated, fully automatic. So when the power does come back on, it has a, a function that senses the mains power and it will measure it for three minutes. And as long as there's no fluctuations in any direction over that three minute period, it will then switch back over to the mains power. And then the generator runs for another three minutes. And if it's not required in that period of time, it just automatically turns off. So that's pretty cool. You basically don't need to do anything as long as it's got fuel. And, you know, all the other engine type stuff, combustion engine type stuff's in order. Uh, I could go away on a holiday tomorrow, uh, leave everything in the fridge. If I go away for a week and leave $1,000 worth of meat in the fridge, not that I do that, but if I did, uh, it'll be safe. It'll be fine because if the power went out, it'd kick in. It'll run for about two days without any fuel. But of course, if you're away on holidays, I've got neighbors and stuff who I'm quite friendly with who could, you know, help top it up and keep things in order. Uh, but that's not really why I have it. I have it so I can work. <laughs> so yeah, if we get yeah. a huge storm over winter, like we did a few years ago and it knocked out power here for almost two weeks, uh, I'll just be pouring diesel in that thing and yeah, uh, keep working away. So that's good. Yeah. Uh, it seems cool. Yeah. Nice. And I'm really happy with those blue Eddy, uh, AC 180 sort of power stations slash UPSs that I bought. Nice. Uh, they work phenomenally well. So when they were installing the generator, the mains power over a two-day period, it took them two days to get it installed and fully up and running because there's you know quite a bit involved. And there was one day there where the pa- the mains power to the property was turned you know off and on two dozen times. And so every time they happened, the lights in the office would turn off, but all the computers, all the networking gear, the servers, everything stayed on. And there was sort of no noise, no flickering, nothing. You would just work and it was completely uninterrupted as your, the name sort of suggests. So they worked well and we had to use them for, I think at one period for four hours, they got down to about 15% uh, power. And okay. when the power came back on, I had to put them in trickle charge mode because otherwise you sort of overload them when you're trying to chuck a thousand into them while powering everything else. Uh, it just doesn't work through a PowerPoint. So it took about a day to recharge them, but that was fine. Uh, and yeah, they, they work a treat. We did have one issue, Balin's one. So I've bought two of them. So for those of you who know, I guess you know, I've got that big, the mega desk that I bought that has sort of the two, what would you call them? Like C-sections, opposing sort yeah, of yeah. C-sections. So I got the the Blue Eddy AC180 for my end. I plug two test systems plus my PC five 32-inch 4K 144 hertz monitors plus speakers, USB devices, and all that stuff go into it, and it works just fine. Uh, you can pull up to 1.8 kilowatts, so um, no no problems there. Uh, and that, that's, as I said, that's been tested many, many times, and it's never failed, never skipped uh, a beat. Balon's one, plugged it in, configured it all the same. We had the NAS server and Balin's workstation on it. And uh, the NAS server, I left a a UPS on. So there was like a UPS to a UPS just because I wanted to suss it all out. And whenever we had the power cut, Balin's computer would just go poof off. But the UPS would still keep the server going. Uh, and we weren't hmm. sure if it was just something to do with Balin's power supply or his computer. Anyway, so I removed the second UPS and just kept the Blue Eddy AC180 and plugged the NAS server into that, booted it all up and sort of cringed a bit because you don't want to you know, lose power to your server at random. But I simulated a mains loss of power by just turning the PowerPoint off and boom, everything turned off. Everything blacked out. The Blue Eddy AC180 just didn't work. Hmm. So okay. I updated the firmware checked all the settings that were the same on mine in Balin's and it's got a really cool app. You know, I'm not paid by Blue Eddy. I bought these myself with my own money. So this is a user uh, experience. Very impressive units. The the Bluetooth software, incredibly good, always connects, never fails. The stuff it gives you is in real time is amazing. And you can copy and paste settings essentially. So I was checking all the settings for mine making sure that they were the same on Balance and they were. So then I'm sort of thinking, okay, is the UPS function on this just, you know, 
broken because it wasn't giving me any errors. It wasn't beeping. It would just not work as a UPS. Everything would turn off despite the AC and DC functions still being live. So a bit of a head scratcher. Uh, and then I took a look at Balin's power supply and it's sort of a light bulb went off. He has one of those 15 amp power supplies in his computer. Uh, right. Yep. So it's only running through a 10 amp socket, which is fine. It just detects that and works, but it must be some sort of initial switching load because it will work between on the spec sheet. It'll, it'll want between eight amps and 15 amps. And I suspect it was going over 10 amps on initial changeover. And that was tripping the blue eddy, but it wasn't giving an error. So anyway, Taking that theory, we went and ripped Balin's workstation PC apart, took the power supply out and put in just an, it was a 1200 watt power supply, an ASUS model. And we chucked in a, one of those uh, Corsair Shift 850 watt ones. I, I bought about four right. of those yeah, on yeah. special during Black, what is it, Black Friday or something like that last year. Anywho, put that in there, 850 is enough power. It's a 10 amp max draw power supply. So it's the standard, you know, the plug you're familiar with. The, the kettle type plug and that fixed the problem so nice plugged that in we can flick the mains power off now the server stays on balance computer stays on so yeah if you have any of those kind of ups's or, it also tripped up the ups as well the dedicated i think it's a power shield 1600 or something we had it was also tripping that up that thing was just flicking on and off it didn't know what the hell to do with balance computer on it um, so it, again, it wasn't telling me what the error was. It just wasn't working. So okay. for those of you in Australia, yeah, those, unless you have a 15 amp sort of battery backup slash UPS type thing, which the Blue Eddy AC 180 isn't, uh, you'll, you'll almost certainly run into problems. So make sure that your computer has a 10 amp max draw power supply in it. All right, cool. Which Interesting. is common in Australia, but probably not so much in America, given that they only run at what, 110 volts? Yeah, so, that's right. It's so a higher amperage over yeah. there for things, I think. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, interesting. All your power problems should be over now. Fingers crossed. Well, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to actually buy another Blue Eddy unit. They've got an AC240 coming out soon, which is essentially the same thing, just a bit more capacity. And I might chuck that on my end because I have the three PCs and move the AC180 over here to where we live stream. Because we can yeah. plug the live stream PC into that, all the mics, all the lights and everything, which we probably should do anyway, because it's really good. Um, and that way we can't get corrupt video footage or anything. Because, you know, we bought the Blackmagic camera to essentially yeah. achieve that same thing. Well, this would do that for everything. So we could be live streaming and the power could go out and we'd be none the wiser. Because the diesel, the <laughs> diesel nice. generator would kick in. We wouldn't hear that. Uh, and the lights overhead we wouldn't have on anyway because we'd be using the big, uh, you know, filming light, the the big aperture light. So for nice. what's thirteen hundred Australian dollars, it's probably a good idea to do that. Really, I mean, it might even be worth you investing in one as well. Um, claim that on your tax and <laughs> ensure that you never, because it's just annoying. Even if you're filming one of your thirty minute long videos and the power goes out. Um, because your, yeah, that's your right. camera would save the data and probably your audio recorder, but you would have to stop filming and wait for the power to come back on because you wouldn't have any lights. Yeah, that's right. I think we've had we had a power outage, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago maybe, but it wasn't for very long. It mm -hmm. only was like for maybe two or three minutes, but that was d enough to have if you were filming, PCs yeah. turn off and stuff. Yeah, the, yeah. the server was fine on the UPS. That never went down, but mm -hmm. yeah, the, the other stuff went off, so that was a bit annoying, but... Yeah, no, it's good to that you're uh, solving your problems out there. And yeah, well, I'll especially keep... before um, any major releases where it could really like power outs during those periods are mm -hmm. no good at all. Yeah, well, I'll keep people updated on these um, Blue Eddy AC180 units because I plan on using them for the foreseeable. So if anything goes wrong with them or any problems, I'll certainly let you know because, as I said, it's not a sponsored thing. I bought them myself. And if they fail me, I'm going to happily tell you about it because I won't be too happy. <laughs> So, so we'll <laughs> yeah, see. Yeah, that'll be interesting. We'll, we'll see how they go. But so far, um, super impressed. Uh, you know, full disclaimer, I've been using them for like two weeks now. So can't speak to the longevity or reliability of them. But just initial setup yeah. and how they're working right now, I'm blown away by how great they are. And much, in my opinion, way better than the UPSs you would typically buy that, you know, they do what they're designed to do, right? They beep, they let you know the mains power's out, and they lay to save and shut down. That's 
the idea they run for a couple of minutes. But the fact that if you're doing something important or you're playing a game and the power goes out, it gives you a couple of hours to finish. You know, the, the power could come back in that time as well, right? Um, but it, it gives you a couple of hours to finish up whatever it was that you were doing um, and then either shut down and save or hope the power comes back in that time. But anyway. Yeah, interesting to see what the longevity is like with the – are they lithium-ion batteries in them? I, I yes. believe so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you Most get, of the usual UPSs use your lead acid stuff, so yeah, it's not, interesting. The definitely not lead acid. You can uh, go to their website, obviously, and have a look. I mean, look, they've m- certainly got competition. There are mm-hmm. possibly other brands that are better, uh, but they 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 Blue Eddy did send me one of their massive units for unboxing boxes. If you guys remember or saw the video where I took my gaming PC down to the bottom of my five acre property, and amongst the uh, yeah, I remember that one the bugs and the insects and whatever wildlife was down there. I played some uh, multiplayer games on Starlink, I think it was. Oh, no, I think I just used my phone. Anyway, it worked great. So I've had that unit for about two years now, and it works as well as the day I got it. So I thought, okay, well, that, that Blue Eddy product that I was sampled was good, so I'll give them a chance with my own hard-earned money and buy a few things for the office, which I've done. As I said, for two weeks now, they've been good. We'll see how they go long term. Cool. All right, yeah, interesting update there. Always seems like people appreciate the old generator and power updates at your place, but mm-hmm. now that that's solved, it'll just be figuring out how that goes long term, I guess. Yes, still no uh, mowing update. I haven't mowed my lawn. Still, everything's still dead. So <laughs> yeah, same. I might do some mowing, uh, mower servicing. I could do a BTS on that for the Harbour and Box viewers. They'd love that. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they would. I'm <laughs> sure they would. But yes, no, we're coming into. What is it for us? Autumn soon, and then winter. There'll be plenty of mowing to get to during those periods. Plenty indeed. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that pretty much wraps this episode of the Hard Run Box podcast up. Just a bit of a mailbag episode. Hopefully, you've enjoyed some of those questions that people have been asking. And yeah, people who are Hard Run Box members have access to our little Discord community, and in there is the podcast channel where people give us some feedback and comments on the podcast and ask us things. So, yeah, future listener mails will probably come from there as well. So that's something to keep in mind. Also, as usual, audio feed, video feed. We've got our YouTube channel. We've got our podcast feeds for anyone who wants to change formats and either see us or maybe you're sick of seeing us or you want to get rid of us, you can just find us on the audio feed. So, yeah. That's pretty much it for this one. We'll be back next week. Neither of us are on holiday. Neither of us are doing anything. So I'll, I'll next come week. up. I'll come up with something. We can't run too many in a row. I'll, I'll think of something, guys. Leave it with me. I'll, I'll screw it up for next week. All right. We'll leave Steve with that. And for now, thanks for listening. We'll see you in the next one.